regional engagement, including in the energy sector, through programs like Asia Edge and the Japan-U.S. Strategic Energy Partnership, JUSEP. As both parties work towards um, realizing the vision for a free and open Indo-Pacific, new challenges and opportunities are presenting themselves, and I hope that we can cover, we can use today's session to uncover um, new insights into how geopolitics of energy are shaping the long-term prospect for Japan's energy plan and U.S.-Japan cooperation. So if successful, Japan's um, new strategy will de deliver significant improvement in efficiency, emissions, cost, and self-sufficiency by 2030 and by 2050. However, during a period of rapid change in the Indo-Pacific, how will geopolitical currents shape Japan's goals, methods, and ultimate outcomes? How will development in global energy markets and shifting regional security calculations shape Japan's future? How is Japan going to diversify its energy portfolio, um, both in terms of suppliers and sources, to enhance its energy security? Given that Japan still relies heavily on the Middle East, what role can U.S.-Japan cooperation play? And ultimately, how do these, all of these questions fit into the broader geopolitics and strategic picture taking shape in the region? I know these are many very challenging questions, but I hope we can cover these important issues and questions as many as possible at today's session because we have an excellent group of panelists. Here in the Scowcroft Center, we work to honor General Brent Scowcroft's legacy of service and embody his ethos of nonpartisan commitment to the cause of security and support for U.S. leadership in cooperation with allies and partners and dedication to the mentorship of the next generation of leaders. I think today's topic touches on many of these issues and we're delighted to be conducting this event in collaboration with the Council's Global Energy Center, which promotes energy, um, which promotes energy security by working alongside government, industry, civil society, and public stakeholders to devise pragmatic solutions to the geopolitical, sustainability, and economical, economic challenges of the changing global energy landscape. As a reminder, this event will be webcast live and on the record. Please join the conversation on Twitter at AC Scowcroft and AC Global Energy. Now, um, I'd like to welcome our panelists. Let me start, let me start by thanking the four of you um, for being here today and introducing you to our audience. Um, to my left, uh, we have Jane Nakano. Ms. Nakano is a senior fellow in the Energy and National Security Program at the Center for Strategic and International Studies, CSIS. Prior to joining CSIS in 2010, Jane worked in the Office of Policy and International Affairs in the U.S. Department of, Department of Energy, where she covered a host of energy, economic, and political issues in Asia. Next, um, we have Shuichi Ito, um, Mr. Ito, Senior Analyst at the Institute of Energy Economics Japan, IEEJ, Associate Fellow of the Institute for Security and Development Policy in Stockholm, and Virtual Fellow of the Reconnecting Asia Project at the CSIS. Next, we have Ellen Yu, Mr. Yu, Senior Fellow and Director for International Climate Policy at the Center for American Progress. Previously, he spent four years at the U.S. Department of DOD, DOE, and he was a director for Asian Affairs. In that post, um, he worked with the Department of uh, Department senior leadership, technical offices, and national labs to coordinate a unified strategy on U.S. energy policy and technical engagement with countries in East, Southeast, and South Asia. Prior to his work at the DOD, DOE, Mr. Yu served for 25 years as a Foreign Service Officer at the State Department. Finally, we're honored to have um, Jun Arima here uh, with us today. Professor Jun Arima uh, be began his career at the Ministry of Economy, Trade, Industry, METI, um, in Japan, um, which was followed by more than three decades of experience in various roles in the field of energy and environment. 
Uh, from 2011 to 15, he was Director General of um, JETRO, Japan External Trade Organization, London office, and he led investment and export promotion. Um, Professor Arima and Mr. Ito are both visiting Washington, D.C. from Japan, so we're, uh, we're honored to be hosting them here today. And we, with that, I'd like to turn um, to each of our panelists to some initial remarks on today's session. Uh, today's question of geopolitics and energy security and the U.S.-Japan alliance. And starting with Jane. <coughs> Um, thank you so much for having me, uh, Mion, and all my friends and colleagues at the Atlantic Council. It's my honor to be here. So um, before we uh, get very uh, focused on the details uh, and the substance of the U.S.-Japan energy ties, I wanted to, so, um, I wanted my, I guess, seven to ten minutes of fame uh, here this morning to focus on the key factors that are shaping the environment in which the two countries' energy ties, uh, energy cooperation relationship uh, has been evolving and needs to continue to evolve. Um, first and foremost is the rise of the United States as a global uh, supplier of oil and gas. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, I'm assuming that this is sort of a mix of uh, um, audience. Some of you may closely follow more of Japan, US, than energy markets in general. but. <coughs> What's been happening to the U.S. energy uh, profile is quite remarkable. Thanks to the shale revolution, U.S. now is a major producer of oil and gas, uh, as well as rising exporter. On the oil side, uh, uh, a couple years ago, uh, the U.S. oil, crude oil pr uh, output hit um, 10 million barrels per day for the first time since the 1970s. Uh, since the ban uh, on the export of the U.S. produced uh, oil, crude oil, was lifted back in December 2015, we've been exporting uh, our crude oil to um, uh, destinations around the world. Uh, and the latest figure is about, um, let me make sure I get this right, about 3 million barrels per day. That's about double the volume uh, compared to about a year ago. Obviously. Um, the volume is not linear. Obviously, you know, uh, there are ups and downs uh, depending on the market condition, but uh, it's still showing a very strong uh, growth. Uh, on the gas side, uh, again, thanks to the shale revolution, we are uh, uh, producing uh, quite a bit of um, <coughs> shale gas, uh, and uh, the um, output grew by about 11% uh, year over year uh, back in 2018. And of which, you know, some get exported to uh, 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 export abroad uh, as a pipeline, natural uh, via pipeline, mainly to Mexico. But also, uh, chunk also uh, goes to um, goes out as LNG. Uh, and so we are in a very strong uh, position. And um, certainly uh, on the resource side, uh, the, the picture is looking quite good. And as many of you may have been following, we are having uh, export uh, liquefaction capacity uh, at it. Uh, um, and right now, uh, it's about, you know, roughly about 4 billion cubic feet per day of liquefaction capacity. But by the end of this year, uh, it's, uh, it's scheduled to uh, more than double to nearly 9 uh, BCF a day. Um, and in many ways, it's not so much that a uh, the export figure really depends on how quickly uh, the export capacity or liquefaction capacity can come online. So it's a very um, uh, nice position to be in. Uh, certainly the rise of the United States as a global uh, uh, oil and gas supplier has increased, uh, has come with many benefits, not just to the U.S. Uh, you know, we have seen some strong job figures, uh, regional economic uh, development, but then also to, I think, a lot of countries around the world, including uh, Japan, but not just Japan, right? Um, you know, the, the increase in volume of LNG in the marketplace has helped increase the liquidity. Also, the business models have become a lot more flexible. Uh, the contractual terms uh, compared to the traditional LNG suppliers um, have um, uh, much more flexible destination restrictions or destination, basically there's no uh, uh, the type of destination uh, restrictions that we have long seen in traditional LNG contracts. Um, also, I, um, I say that 
uh, you know, Japan and many of the uh, East Asian um, LNG importers have long uh, depended on sort of southern sea routes or like Strait of Malacca, or actually to be more specific, like South China Seas, mm -hmm. for much of its hydrocarbon imports. Um, and you know, ha in having the U.S. as a new supplier, that um, you know, the where the LNG can be shipped through the Panama Canal, even though I think Panama Canal still needs, um, you know, could be expanded, and and uh, there, you know, we can certainly talk about this during Q and A, but um, it's not quite there yet. I, perhaps I mean, there's still room for Panama Canal to be uh, even more prominent in um, strengthening the um, the trade, LNG trade uh, with uh, Asia, but. Having the U.S. Uh, as a new supplier and also presenting new routes strong, uh, strengthen uh, energy security in Asia, and then, <coughs> um, but I I, um, I also wanted to mention that uh, U.S.-Japan energy ties uh, is not just about energy security. There's a strong energy economic dimension to it. Um, you know, U.S. has become much less dependent on energy imports. Uh, for example, the value of energy imports. Uh, uh, um, over uh, the value of um, energy exports have uh, uh, come down from about 10 times to about 1.5 times, uh, so much less dependent. Uh, in, in this context, I think you know, the, this has become an uh, important component of how the U.S. probably sees uh, global energy markets. But also, Japan has been part of the equation, not just by investing in um, LNG uh, export facilities in the U.S., but also, you know, Japan has been uh, committing to LNG uh, volumes, also oil, um, well, crude oil, as well as petroleum product imports by Japan uh, make up an uh, important part of uh, U.S. energy trade uh, uh, picture today. But um, for this part, I guess, um, but before I go to China, um, China uh, portion, I wanted to s just mention that, you know, it's as, um, but you know, it's one question I think, you know, when we think about the energy market dimension, maybe, you know, what's, what more could be there? Um, because the oil, gas, and hydrocarbon exports uh, make up about half of U.S. energy exports to Japan. But energy, the bilateral energy trade itself only accounts for 7% of the to total bilateral trades, mm -hmm. trade between the two countries. So what more could be done? Um, quickly about China. Do I still have a couple minutes left? Sure, yeah. Okay. Sure. Is that um, you know the rise of China uh, or continued um, the China's continued rise as a market um, uh, sort of a energy market shaper is a very important uh, factor uh, uh, for the environment that the two uh, the U.S. and Japan uh, um, exist. Um, and you know we do hear quite a bit about uh, China's uh, GDP growth rates coming down. You know uh, we you know they just had a um, uh, People's Congress recently and you know set out 6.5 percent as the new um, annual target. But that doesn't mean that it's you know it's it's not becoming you know it's no longer important uh, player in the global energy market. It still accounts for about you know uh, uh, one fifth of the global energy um, demand, uh, also of the, the global demand growth, uh, China will continue to be important for another you know, next couple of decades. And I think how, um, and also uh, China is uh, increasingly import, uh, dependent on both oil and gas imports, even though at home they're doing quite a bit, uh, trying to explore shale gas resources. Uh, also looking at you know sort of new fields as their old uh, Dachin field um, you know has matured quite a bit, um, but so you know China will be uh, a very much sort of important player for uh, in not just in Asian energy uh, market dynamics but the global dynamics, and um, just then but I think when we think of something like uh, you know Belt and, and uh, Road Initiative I always wonder you know how you know, would U.S. and Japan, you know, um, relate to that? You know, is that very much, you know, cooperative relationship or it's more of a rivalry, hopefully healthy one. Um, but, you know, there are concerns that loom over the Belt and Road Initiative. Um, uh, according to the Boston University's excellent uh, uh, database, um, 
you know, Chinese financing has been going into many energy projects around the world. Um, and you know, last year's figure was uh, you know, about $8.6 billion of energy project financing by uh, China, especially the uh, Development Bank and their Exxon Bank, uh, about $8 billion uh, uh, when uh, we're, f I'm sorry, of the global total of $8.6 billion, $8 billion came from China. And of which I think there are a lot of uh, uh, analysis, a lot of uh, sort of a scrutiny as to you know, its emissions impact, uh, I think you know uh, a lot of money uh, is still going into uh, more of a high emission uh, inten or emission intensive uh, projects, and also you know we read quite a bit about uh, this debt concern uh, in some of the Asian countries uh, uh, as they you know uh, get more engaged in the built and road energy projects. So in many ways, how you know U.S. and Japan try to uh, consider perhaps the, the energy governance, the new energy governance system in Asia or, or globally, uh, but then also economic governance for that matter uh, will be quite important. Yeah, to what extent that a rule-based uh, trade and investment in the energy sector could be uh, uh, maintained and, uh, and uh, engage China in important discourse. Um, and then quickly on the, 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 um, the the tech side, you know, China is a uh, leading uh, investor in the clean energy technology. Uh, the government has identified uh, things like nuclear and high voltage transmission systems as strategic uh, uh, technology industries. So as you know, US, US and Japan under this energy collaboration uh, uh, um, sort of a theme, uh, consider how to leverage its strength. And both the US and Japan are high tech countries but what's the value that the, this collaboration can bring to the table? Um, and you know, so that's, that's another thing that we might uh, uh, sort of you know, consider um, during the course of the, the debate. And then quickly third, and this is just a 30 second comment, um, the third you know, point that I, uh, factor that I, that I um, think will you know, continue to shape the, the environment that the US-Japan energy relations will evolve, of course, you know, will be the continued instability in the Middle East, um, you know, there, uh, and I don't really need to go in, but you know, there's a lot of rivalries in the region, and you know, the Middle East still continues to be an important source of hydrocarbon and many of the energy trading invest, well, especially trade side for Japan. So how uh, the Middle East ev uh, um, evolves and how the U.S. relationship with the regional players there in the Middle East will certainly affect the way that uh, uh, Japan. Uh, uh, in, you know, relates to uh, its important partner partners in the Middle East. So, I guess I'll stop there. Thank you. That was excellent. So, Mr. Ito, now stage mm. is yours. <laughs> yes. Uh, first of all, I'd like to express some um, sincere gratitude to the attendant council, especially Dr. Young O and her excellent colleagues for having me along with the distinguished experts on the topic we are talking today. Well, uh, Jay has already talked a lot about what is going on in terms of U.S.-Japan bilateral uh, mm -hmm. links, and um, I'd like to develop more of the uh, global aspect of the um, U.S.-Japan uh, cooperation collaboration. Um, well, I'd like to focus on three of these new challenges. Washington and Tokyo are just encountering as of today and in the decade to come, I believe. Uh, well, uh, actually, uh, as Jane already talked about, the shale gas revolution is such a big bonanza or serendipity for Japanese energy security. Ever since the first oil shock in the early 1970s, it has been of vital importance for Japan to diversify its hydrocarbon uh, imports. Well, uh, so sorry. Well, I'm going to the. the so, so well, uh, although uh, Japan is still dependent upon uh, its um, uh, crude import on the um, Middle East for close to 90 percent uh, but um, well as for natural gas uh, compared with good oil 
uh, the natural gas import portfolio is fairly diverse for us. In addition to that, the thanks to the, the uh, benefits of the U.S. shale gas revolution, we have found new opportunities to further relax Reacts advance reliance upon the uh, uh, very critical sea lane of communication cutting across South China Sea and East China Sea. And uh, when we uh, talk about the, the, um, the sea lane uh, communication across the Pacific Ocean, it is a very free from you know, geopolitical concerns for Japanese uh, and the security. And uh, Japanese gas companies, utilities, trading houses have already in inked uh, agreement for more than 20 million tons of LNG from the US Law 48, including a uh, purchase and sales agreement and tolling agreements, which is actually uh, equivalent to around a quarter of Japan's total LNG import as of. Uh, 2017, it's huge. And plus, uh, actually, uh, Japanese companies are not going to, to bring all the, you know, uh, the figures, the LNG contracts, uh, back to Japanese markets. As a matter of fact, uh, Japanese natural gas demand has already peaked and it's, uh, it's already been to decline. And but thanks to all the new um, um, uh, benefit advantages of the signing contract with uh, U.S. LNG producers, uh, including the, the you know the the um, new introduction of uh, Henry Hub based uh, gas passing mechanism, and with that, uh, Japan is very um, happy to relax its over dependence upon previous oil index passing mechanism and uh, importing gas from the United States is basically free from what's called distinction clause, etc, etc, etc. And Japanese buyers are already becoming portfolio players in the global market. And um, you know, this uh, side shows the uh, one of the projected changes of global gas flows. Up until recently, you know, uh, the, um, the uh, let's say, in the next uh, about uh, uh, less than two decades, the, the, the volume of LNG import from the United States, North America, will drastically increase. And according to IEA's uh, recent analysis, the United States is projected to become the, the biggest LNG exporter by the mid 2020s. And then uh, I'd like to elaborate uh, a little bit about its um, geopolitical challenges. Well, what is happening on world politics as of today? Uh, well, are the for Japan and um, the United States? Uh, namely uh, Russia and China are posing new challenges, many geopolitical and security challenges. As for Russia, uh, Vladimir Putin is now trying to make Russia uh, one of the biggest energy exporters. Well, as of today, you know, we have such big exporters like Qatar, Australia, and the United States. And uh, up until today, most of uh, Russia's natural gas supplies are, you know, transported by pipeline to Europe. But for many reasons, Russia is facing tremendous challenges of in its traditional market, and Russia is now trying to become another energy, energy big supplier. And this is something we have to bear in mind. What kind of geopolitical challenges are, you know, coming around? And uh, well, since time is limited, I just want to uh, give you s some other ideas for later discussions. Uh, well, second, well, I think uh, we shouldn't underestimate the existing, the existing importance of coal 
on on the global scale. Uh, for me, uh, including environmentalists, call it such, such just dirty results. But the question is, I like to raise is that call in itself is not necessarily so bad. The question is how to use it, who uses it, and I like to show you. Um, Bro, something. Sorry. Oops, sorry. Next slide. Oops. Excuse. Oops. Yeah. <laughs> I think this side. Okay. Now that you know, uh, U.S. state and. Uh, some other Western states are concerned about China's PR activities on the global scale. And uh, the energy infrastructure export is one of strategic targets of our Beijing PR initiative. And uh, <coughs> well, while uh, many Western countries are concerned, as they over concerned about the, the use of utilization of coal as such, uh, actually, China is starting to expand its exports, including clean coal technologies. Well, uh, in many developing countries in the world, especially, coal is still one of the cheapest uh, ways to generate power, and uh, we we do have. Uh, replacement uh, for the coal uh, utilization. Well, renewable is beautiful, we should encourage, but it doesn't mean that uh, the rapid expansion of renewables can easily replace the use of coal in many parts of the world. And this is something we have to bear in mind. Uh, I'm not saying that coal is beautiful, I am not. but. We need to be careful uh, where in the world we are talking about the, the, the merit of uh, using clean coal technologies. And the clean technologies is the field both U.S. and Japan have advanced you know, experiences and technologies as such. So we need to uh, talk about it very carefully, case by case. And lastly, I also like to bring your attention to what is going on in the global nuclear market. Well, for both the United States and Japan, against the background of different reasons, the uh, civilian nuclear sector is facing uh, tremendous business challenges here in the United States. Gas is getting cheaper and cheaper thanks to shale gas revolution. And for Japan, we are still suffering from the aftermath of the Fukushima disaster. And uh, as for the United States and Japan, uh, actually, nuclear business is private sector oriented. But today in the world, China and Russia are rapidly accelerating their presence in the global nuclear civilian market and you know both China and um, uh, Russia have state-backed nuclear vehicles they can expand the market regardless of business profit as such with that uh, they you know also starting to, to expand the geopolitical uh, presence influence in the Middle East Eastern Europe etc so we have to think it more than twice whether it is wise for Washington and Tokyo to leave the nuclear question only to the matter of private business. Uh, actually, on this topic, the Atlantic Council, uh, Dr. Bob Eco did an excellent uh, work. I'm actually echoing his work on U.S. nuclear power leadership and, and the Chinese and Russian uh, challenge you can find it on the website of Atlantic Council. And one thing I'd like to add on his you know, excellent report is that Japan also needs to you know, take tremendous responsibility 
to work with the United States to, to, to how to maintain uh, more than Iran. Let's say a certain range of presence in the global, globally expanding Syrian nuclear market. And as a result of that, it will give some answers for what kind of non proliferation regime we like to have in this world. I end up here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Shuichi. Alan, okay. thank you. Uh, thank you, Mion, and uh, thanks for inviting me to, to join this group. Um, I want to take a slightly different approach to uh, my remarks. Uh, you know, Jane and uh, Shoichi uh, spoke much more kind of at a global level. I wanted to speak a little bit about uh, the U.S.-Japan engagement on energy cooperation. Um, uh, I'd like to draw a little bit on my experience uh, as the uh, DOE's Director of uh, the Office of Asian Affairs, as well as uh, to reflect a little bit on the, the positioning from my current uh, organization, the Center for American Progress. Um, to look at the role of uh, U.S.-Japan energy cooperation, both from the geostrategic as well as the commercial perspectives. Um, one, uh, I think uh, uh, I'd like to focus on uh, the role of that cooperation in advancing U.S. and Japan uh, uh, shared geopolitical interests uh, in the in Indo-Pacific region. Uh, but two, also, I'd argue uh, that there's an important role and responsibility of our two countries uh, to lead and act on climate change, which uh, I would argue the Trump administration is abdicating uh, leadership on. Um, that U.S. and Japan cooperation on energy occurs under three main vehicles, two with some track record uh, of collaboration, uh, JUSEP, the Japan-U.S. Uh, Strategic Energy Partnership, and uh, the U.S. program on Asia Edge, uh, and then one that holds potential for uh, increased cooperation, uh, namely the, um, uh, the eventual launch of the new uh, Development Finance Corporation, or the new OPIC. Um, so let me do a summary of each of these three very briefly and then conclude with uh, what I think the U.S.-Japan energy cooperation should look like. Um, first, on GSEP, uh, as you may recall, uh, the, uh, when President Trump visited in uh, Tokyo in 2017, he and Prime Minister Abe announced uh, the uh, GSEP with a focus at that point on uh, four main areas of cooperation. Uh, advancing uh, civil nuclear technology, work in the coal sector with a focus on uh, high efficiency, low emission, and uh, carbon capture utilization of storage technologies. Three, developing uh, LNG markets, and four, uh, working together on um, advancing energy infrastructure opportunities in developing markets, mainly Southeast Asia, South Asia, and Africa. Um, in the aftermath of the, uh, the leaders meeting, uh, uh, members of uh, governments on both sides got together, started to work, uh, work out the details. I uh, had the good fortune of uh, being a part of um, uh, many of those discussions. We uh, focused on developing four main work streams. Uh, one, regional integration, uh, two, capacity building, uh, three, commercial collaboration, and uh, four, project finance cooperation. Um, in the year and a half since the announcement, there have been some uh, meaningful um, accomplishments. Uh, two sides brought together their respective uh, private sector representatives together for matchmaking in um, third countries. Uh, most recently, just a few weeks ago, uh, in Jakarta, uh, as well as a few months ago in Vietnam, uh, our two governments, Medi uh, and uh, principally, as well as State Department and Department of Energy, um, brought together um, uh, private sector representatives, uh, uh, mainly focused on LNG. Um, both sides have uh, shared information with each other on government relations and market opportunities in these uh, developing countries. Uh, and they've also run uh, a couple of joint energy-related uh, capacity building uh, programs for policymakers, regulators uh, from Southeast Asia, again, uh, mainly on LNG uh, infrastructure. Uh, so, uh, a, you know, a number of uh, accomplishments, uh, a game plan going forward, um, my disenchantment. Uh, my disenchantment is 
uh, an excessive focus on LNG, um, solely focused on LNG markets and the LNG infrastructure in South and Southeast Asia. Um, I think these two sides are neglecting the growing clean energy opportunities in those markets. And it's a shame to bring our efforts and resources together and disregard this important sector, both from a commercial as well as a sustainability perspective. More on that later. Um, the second uh, program is Asia Edge. As you may recall, in July of 2018, uh, Secretary Pompeo announced uh, the economic and commercial elements of the President's uh, Indo-Pacific strategy. Um, the administration identified three future-oriented sectors for action, digital economy, uh, infrastructure, and energy. Um, Asia Edge is the U.S.'s whole-of-government approach uh, to energy cooperation in the region. So the, uh, from Asia Edge's perspective, the objectives for the region are to strengthen energy security, uh, increase energy diversification and trade, uh, and ent expand energy access across the region. Again, in that uh, period since the announcement, um, uh, U.S. agencies have gotten together, uh, tried to flesh this out a little bit more. Uh, they've uh, narrowed it down to four programmatic focal points. One, regional market uh, integration, uh, energy sector transformation, uh, utility modernization, and uh, transparent and best practices procurement. Um, at the time of the announcement, uh, Secretary Pompeo said uh, that the U.S. wished to uh, work with like-minded partners uh, under Asia Edge. And in that context, when Vice President Pence uh, visited uh, Tokyo uh, last November, uh, Japan announced that it would uh, coordinate with Asia Edge on Japan's $10 billion in support for LNG infrastructure investments and capacity building. Um, uh, so you'll see, you're seeing a pattern of, uh, uh, of the work between our, the focus, the prioritization between our two governments. Um, Asia Edge is still in its early stages, but a couple of observations, um, like JUSEP, uh, a focus on capacity building uh, and commercial advocacy, I think those are admirable objectives, uh, but again, again, also a significant focus on LNG. Um, but I would say uh, under Asia Edge, there is some signs of a more diverse energy portfolio, uh, some discussion about electricity uh, systems digitization, uh, power systems transformation. Um, the last uh, uh, vehicle is the Development Finance Corporation. Um, uh, last October, President Trump signed the BUILD Act which uh, consolidates, modernizes, and reforms the uh, U.S. government's uh, development finance capabilities. Um, the DFC uh, uh, will combine uh, OPIC as well as USAID's development credit authority functions while adding new authorities and resources. Um, among those, uh, the DFC will be able to take uh, equity investment stakes in, uh, in projects. Uh, the capitalization uh, levels will rise to $60 billion, uh, current OPIC uh, caps at $29 billion. Um, and the requirement for the U.S. Uh, involvement nexus in these projects is, will, will become more flexible. So these new authorities uh, may make it easier for uh, the DFC to work with partners like Nexi, and I know that um, uh, the U.S. and uh, Japanese uh, um, uh, agencies are talking about, the, about potential work together. Um, the administration is targeting uh, the launch of uh, the DFC by October 1st, um, uh, and uh, I expect that that, that will come, uh, you know, uh, come to pass uh, um, at the beginning of the fiscal year. But uh, going forward, uh, you know, there's going to be a lot of work uh, that um, uh, we'll have to take uh, to get things on track. I mean, the key focus will be um, you know, working on merging these two, uh, these two organizations, uh, the old OPEC and DCA. Um, and then also the, the new DFC is going to have to sort through a number of uh, new policies and procedures. Um, there's going to be a new governance structure. Um, there's going to be uh, figuring out how, when, and how to use its equity authority. Um, and then the questions about implementation of this flexibility of the U.S. content and nexus among other topics. 
Um, energy will certainly be an important part of the DFC portfolio, uh, but I think it's early to say uh, in what sectors, you know, potentially beyond LNG, hopefully, um, and how the DFC will partner with, uh, with other uh, development finance institutions. So let me turn to my perspective on U.S.-Japan energy cooperation. Um, uh, like I said, while I was at DOE, I was involved in the launch and development of uh, JUSEP and Asia Edge, uh, a little less so on, uh, on DFC. From the U.S. government perspective, all three of these initiatives are designed to advance U.S. geostrategic and commercial goals. On the geostrategic front, all three were seen as vehicles to, f to affirm our commitment to a presence in the region, our economic engagement, uh, and our support for a, a free and fair, free and open trade and investment climate. On the commercial perspective, I saw senior U.S. officials prioritizing these initiatives as vehicles for deals, as a reflection of the Trump administration's America First orientation the geopolitical considerations were secondary. Regrettably, the President's focus on trade deficits has made the U.S. vulnerable uh, to seeking quick results actions on these kinds of mechanisms. For example, uh, a, an overemphasis, in my uh, opinion, on moving U.S. commodities uh, more so than higher value chain opportunities. As a former diplomat and senior energy official, I was always committed to advancing U.S. private sector opportunities and interests. But let me uh, make two key points. One, um, in these three initiatives, it's important for the U.S. government to focus its policy, fiscal, and technical resources to help restore some of our geo geostrategic standing in the region, uh, which has been damaged. Building policy and technical capacity, restoring the U.S. reputation for le leadership and reliability, and solidifying the U.S.-Japan partnership brand in the region can serve both causes of repairing our reputation and creating conditions for our commercial objectives, if not necessarily assuring specific delivery of specific deals. Second point. I'd argue that the U.S. and Japan should also position these three vehicles to play a central role in helping countries drive clean energy transitions more quickly and comprehensively, which contributes to what we need to do on climate change. Regional governments are seeing renewables, grid modernization, efficiencies, uh, energy efficiency as positive vis-a-vis -vis their concerns on diversity of supply, uh, air pollution, and energy access. And with renewable costs plummeting, afford affordability is increasingly a positive. I recognize that coal's abundance plus uh, vested interests uh, will remain hurdles for faster and broader renewables uh, penetration, but these are not insurmountable hurdles. Markets are signaling this clean energy transition is inevitable. The question is pacing. And I'd argue the pacing needs to be much more urgent. The U.S. and Japan can be leaders. They can help countries build capacity to help make wise policy, regulatory, and procurement decisions, and potentially sell some U.S. and Japanese equipment and services. Uh, but more importantly, the U.S. and Japan have a responsibility to lead, to help make headway on our global existential climate change crisis. Pragmatically, there will be a prominent role for LNG in the near term. So there's an LNG, there's an appropriate role for LNG in these three mechanisms. But there needs to be a balance. The U.S. and Japan should urgently elevate the role of renewables deployment, grid resilience and security, power system transformation, energy efficiency, et cetera, in their JUSEP, Asia Edge, and DFC work. I recognize what I'm advocating is not aligned with this administration's energy outlook, but I think it's the right course for both the United States and Japan from a global security as well as from a U.S. and Japanese commercial perspective. Um, and as a parting point, I'd expect if there's a Democratic administration in 2021, uh, it would take these programs in this direction. Those are my thoughts.
Thank you, Ellen. And now turn to Professor Arima. Uh, <coughs> thank you very much. Uh, again, uh, thank you very much for inviting me to uh, this very much interesting thank session. Uh, since I think uh, it would be better to pre uh, present a little bit about uh, Japanese energy and climate quadrilemma or trilemma or something uh, to uh, ensure better understanding about what is going on in Japan. Uh, the screen which you are looking at is uh, the energy balance uh, underpinning a Japanese 26% uh, emission reduction target uh, based on the Paris Agreement. And as you can see, uh, in 2030, uh, we are aiming at uh, some sort of rough, uh, say, uh, equal uh, share of each energy sources, 26% uh, coal, 27% LNG, and 22-20% nuclear, and 22-24% uh, from renewables. And uh, in order to work out this uh, energy mix, uh, we have gone through some sort of uh, simultaneous equation exercise, uh, simultaneously uh, achieving first restore energy self-efficiency sufficiency uh, to around 25%, surfacing the pre-earthquake level. And second, uh, reduce the electricity cost, which has gone up uh, significantly after earthquake. Um, and also third, uh, present comparable greenhouse gas emission reduction go goals with other developed countries like the US and EU. And uh, this uh, energy mix is well crafted because, uh, you know, as you can see, uh, the brown part represent uh, the thermal power, uh, sorry, fossil fuel import cost uh, for uh, say promoting thermal power. And it is to be dramatically reduced by restarting nuclear and introducing renewables and also energy efficiency. And uh, by reducing that thermal import cost, uh, the fossil fuel import cost, uh, we are going to absorb uh, the expanding FIT, uh, fixed feed in tariff surcharge uh, for expanding renewables. So uh, to make it happen, uh, the restarting nuclear is very much important for Japan. Uh, because, you know, uh, if we stick to 26% while we cannot achieve restarting of nuclear, then only way is uh, redouble our efforts for energy efficiency and redouble our efforts for uh, renewables. But unfortunately, uh, while renewable energy cost is plummeted, uh, as Mr. Yu said, uh, globally, but in Japan it is too expensive uh, looking at, at the FIT prices. So uh, only depending on uh, renewable as a non-fossil fuel, that will significantly increase uh, Japanese energy cost. And this is uh, the marginal abatement cost uh, of various countries' NDCs, nationally determined contribution. And uh, al already factoring in uh, the restarting of nuclear, still uh, Japan's 26% reduction target is much more expensive uh, than those of EU, uh, US, and China. And uh, looking at China, uh, though China is perceived as the leader of climate, uh, but uh, their target is, uh, say, uh, peaking out of their emissions in 2030. So that will happen in any way. So looking at uh, the marginal cost, uh, that is almost zero. So uh, the level playing field with China and other trading partners is a very much strong preoccupation for Japan. So therefore, uh, and also, Japan's energy price is much more expensive compared with our major trading partners. Uh, this is uh, the comparison of industrial electricity prices in major countries. And Japanese electricity price uh, for industry is even more expensive than that of Germany, and of course, much, much more expensive than that of China and US. So uh, therefore, uh, in say pursuing uh, energy mix, uh, which is simultaneously achieving energy security and environmental protection and economic efficiency, the best mix is our preoccupation. So otherwise, uh, you know, we will lose our balance. So uh, that is uh, the preoccupation uh, when uh, which Japanese uh, policymakers are always obsessed. And then um, talking about climate change, uh, since Mr. Yu mentioned, uh, we think that climate change is a global issue. So it is not meaningful uh, to just solely uh, focus on domestic emissions. And uh, we feel a lot of potential uh, for uh, out of border or across the border, beyond the border emission reductions. First, as you can see in the uh, dark blue part, uh, we can export uh, high efficient technologies to developing countries where uh, you know, the, they can reduce uh, their greenhouse, greenhouse gas emissions relatively cheaply and cost effectively. And second, in the red part, 
uh, we can provide uh, the energy efficient uh, intermediate products uh, to global value chain. So uh, Japanese companies ma can make a lot of contribution uh, for reducing greenhouse gas emissions overseas. And ultimately, uh, you know, since uh, global warming is a long-term issue, and uh, global warming can only achieve it by development of innovative technologies, so Japan can, can take a lead uh, through innovation. And in the innovation, uh, I'm, I'm going to touch upon later, but yeah, in the innovation, uh, I find a lot of potential uh, for US-Japan collaboration. Then uh, let me say, uh, with that slide, uh, turn to a possible area of US-Japan collaboration. Uh, since uh, this has been already mentioned by uh, previous speakers, uh, obviously, uh, you know, LNG uh, is an usual suspect, and we are already uh, starting to import US LNG, and that is uh, the, uh, the uh, shared benefit for both US and Japan. And second, uh, you know, since I have been talking about climate change, uh, I'd like to have some sort of you know, US-Japan collaboration to imbue more pragmatism uh, to climate debate uh, and climate and energy debate. So for example, you know, US government is often saying that uh, they're going to take, say, uh, all options uh, available approach. That is, you know, in order to achieve energy security and energy access and climate change mitigation, we should pursue all the options, including renewable and nuclear and CCS and clean use of fossil fuel, including clean core technologies. And I strongly endorse uh, that kind of approach because uh, having attended uh, COP meetings many times, I have observed very much you know, the ideological rejection of certain type of energy, like nuclear, like CCS, or coal, and coal is actually demonized in environmental circles. But uh, looking at uh, the energy reality in many Asian countries, um, you know, uh, it would be too premature to argue that coal is a past energy. Uh, they are still present energy. And so long as coal is continuously used in those countries, then what matters is how to ensure the clean use of coal and efficient use of coal. And uh, of course, in certain areas, uh, renewable uh, will make economic sense. So then uh, we should pursue renewable option, but we should not say uh, completely abandon or reject uh, from outset uh, the core options. So that kind of pragmatism is quite important. Then uh, the next uh, item I'd like to emphasize is, uh, as, as, as I said before, uh, the long-term solution uh, through innovation. And then uh, US and Japan could collaborate uh, in such areas as hydrogen or CCUS or advanced nuclear or advanced renewables and so on. And both Japan and the US has a strong uh, emphasis on technology. So uh, this is uh, the area where US and Japan can take a lead. Uh, in uh, global endeavor for combating climate change. And then uh, the other thing I'd like to say is, uh, well, uh, under the Paris Agreement, uh, it's a bottom-up framework. So uh, the NDC of each country is not necessarily uh, comparable efforts. So uh, we need to ensure some sort of, um, you know, the concerted efforts for ensuring level playing field uh, with our uh, trading competitors. Uh, in particular China, because China is a very much strong trade promoter. And um, uh, looking at China's uh, NDCs, I, I doubt uh, whether uh, they are making their comparable efforts with their capacity. And also, uh, there is a very much uh, lack of uh, sufficient transparency of uh, carbon footprint or carbon disclosure of state-owned enterprises. So thanks to uh, the Paris Agreement, uh, we have transparency framework, and also we have TCFD, so uh, we can jointly uh, urge uh, China uh, to disclose uh, more uh, carbon-related information. So uh, that is uh, very much important uh, for, sharing, uh, for ensuring level playing field in uh, trade competition uh, with those uh, emerging economies. And uh, the another uh, say, uh, uh, apparatus which could be used is uh, quality investment, uh, which is uh, now being emphasized in APEC arena. And, uh, you know, as Mr. Ito presented, uh, China is making many, many investments uh, in Asia and other developing country, Asia, uh, developing country regions of uh, various energy-related projects. So uh, we need to ensure that uh, any, how can I say, overseas energy-related investment should be environmentally sustainable. So uh, that kind of, you know, the uh, quality of investment is also uh, the area where Japan and the uh, U.S. can take a lead. So uh, that's all, all what I'd like to say. Thank you very much. <coughs>
Thank you very much um, for offering really excellent, insightful remarks, which um, I think our audience and also including myself have learned a lot. And really, um, your remarks provided an excellent groundwork for today's discussion. As a moderator, I'd like to pose a question. I know that most of you or all of you have um, touched upon the issue of China. And then I'd like to hear more um, on China. And whenever we get into the discussion about Japanese and US engagement in the Indo-Pacific, China is also um, a big question mark. And how much US-Japan energy cooperation in the Indo-Pacific about competition with China? Jane has mentioned on BRI, so um, do, you re, do, you, um, do you view um, the free and open Indo-Pacific strategy is a competing concept with uh, Belt and Road Initiative, all of you, and um, especially Japan um, is seeking recently to improve relations with China and also Russia. I think, um, Shoichi, you could probably mention about Russia, but will improve relations affect Japan's energy relation with both countries and where does that leave the United States and what are the opportunities and challenges. So I'd like to hear and also, and then um, before we open up uh, the floor for questions, I would like to hear if you have any uh, reactions to other panelists. For example, um, I think um, Ellen, you, um, you really raised an interesting issue. Um, US, you mentioned that US excessive focus on LNG, and then you might have a reaction to the clean coal technology, and then the reality, and Arima Sang, your, um, um, your um, suggestions, um, the long-term but long-term um, technology innovation, but then also should be more pragmatic um, for both countries. Mm -hmm. And your insight um, to talk about China and other aspects, it's all very interesting. So I'd like to hear a little more about China and then hear um, from you if you have any reactions to other panelists, and then we'd like to open the floor for the questions. Who would you like to start first? about China to sure, more? Sure. Um, so sure. Um, Thank you. Uh, so in yeah. my view, uh, this free and open Indo-Pacific vision, is especially the economic half of uh, Indo-Pacific sort of strategy vision by the administration is very much an answer to um, BRI, the Belt and Road Initiative, in that, um, you know, in, in many ways, I think there are a lot of things that are still uh, undefined about BRI, but it's been exciting in that th there's this grand vision by this rising economy, um, and obviously also, you know, uh, has, you know, has come with a lot of uh, money, um, but, in, and, but, there, but there was no sort of a Western uh, concrete uh, commentary, if you will, uh, uh, by a major government, and I think uh, this, you know, free and open in the Pacific uh, vision uh, provides sort of uh, um, U.S. and, and the like-minded countries uh, response to as to how we could engage um, with China. Um, but I think um, you know. But I, I think you know. Still, you know, um, there as Alan said, there are all these vehicles but we haven't quite seen um, the outcome. Uh, and obviously, you know, it's, you know, they're still new, so I'm not saying that I, you know, it, it's too soon to judge. But at the same time, I think it's still useful to have some or organizing um, principle that Western countries can um, uh, respond to, to figure out, well, is that how my government feels about the, way, you know, the rise of China? How much uh, common interests and visions, you know, do we share with this administration? Um, at least there's something to react to, if you will. But then also for many of the uh, developing countries in Asia, in Southeast Asia or South Asia, uh, to have another vision, uh, whether they're in a direct competition or not, um, it, it's a healthier thing, I think. It sort of gives them a pause and, and say, okay, well, you know, there is another way to perhaps approach uh, economic development, whether it's energy access um, or you know infrastructure, uh, much more you know the energy infrastructure heavy 
type of uh, um, uh, uh, questions. Um, and just to add to, um, uh, additionally, uh, I wanted to mm. echo, um, I'm not sure if, if I, uh, my, maybe the, the uh, um, well, the, you know, Alan mentioned the, the importance of, and without putting words into your mouth, but, um, you know, having much more comprehensive look at energy needs. So, you know, um, as I've mentioned, you know, LNG export, uh, LNG has been a major focus, and I think it has a practical value. But, you know, from the U.S. perspective, um, uh, you know, it's, it's not a necessarily the biggest, you know, portion of, you know, what we export to begin with. But then from the receiving uh, end as well, um, you know, I, I think the, when a lot of countries think of the U.S., I think it's the capacity building, it's the expertise that they think of not necessarily sort of, you know, certainly not the cheap money because we don't really spend the way that the Chinese uh, have been spending money. So, so it has to be a much more a full package approach, not, you know, not just trying to match make um, the, you know, the, what we got to sell versus what they might be able to consume, but look at the energy system as a whole, not just the power system, energy system as a whole, and look at the power side, transportation side, industrial side, and then see how we could, our engagement in energy sector in, in Southeast Asia, or South Asia could be the sustained one that, you know, doesn't sort of, you know, um, come and go at, in every four years, every eight years. Um, because you know our credibility as a nation uh, could be questioned when we sort of you know start giving them a, a different menu every time we sit down for dinner <laughs> together. So mm. that's just my two cents. Thank you. Great. Who would you like to uh, say next? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, follow up. I'm just going to elaborate the question of Russia. Mm -hmm. I'd like to give a small footnote to what you know. Um, Jane talking about perhaps and um, well as we get to the question we don't need to you know, have any records competition all we need is internationally comprehensible sustainable transparent rule of game as well as China plays on the ground you no know, they're more than welcome to, to work together to talk and uh, let me focus on Russia question. Well, uh, first of all, I'd like to clarify myself. I talk everything in my personal capacity, representing none of four affiliations that I have here find in my bio. Well, uh, as we already you know, talked, uh, Washington and Tokyo are currently working together. So how to expand new gas market especially in Asia, including Southeast Asia and Southeast Asia, to absorb would be additional supplies from the US dollar 48 against the background that US is becoming the top LNG exporter in a matter of time. And as I already mentioned um, uh, today, Russia is now trying to become one of the leading LNG exporters in less than a decade. And this is Vladimir Putin's, uh, one of the most important strategic targets. And the question is, what is the point for Tokyo to help it out? I don't think you need to learn calculus in mathematics, integration, this integration. I don't know if you like it or not. You need to know only basic arithmetic, right? Uh, Tokyo has already agreed to expand, even cultivate new market to absorb energy from the lower 48. Then what's the point to boost uh, Russia's energy export capacities, especially in the Arctic area, where Russia combined energy strategy with military strategy as such? Thank you. Uh, so uh, I, ag I agree with uh, Shoichi that uh, we shouldn't be necessarily looking at uh, uh, the U.S. engagement uh, uh, globally in, the, in these areas as competition with China. I mean, I think what we ought to be doing is we ought to be the United States and Japan 
uh, ought to be leading as a model for you know how uh, commerce and trade and uh, good governance works. And we should engage China. We should uh, we should not start out from the beginning uh, with uh, um, starting from a presupposition that. Uh, um, uh, that the Chinese are not uh, going to operate in that way. I mean, you, 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 can, make, you can make an assessment on uh, whether or not that's actually happening, but the engagement ought to be an engagement uh, directly to, to as a uh, partnership and or challenge to, for us to work together in, in that regard. Um, but I think the challenge that we have, the United States, frankly, is that you know we've got these me these mechanisms. We've got a terrific partnership uh, with Japan, uh, um, not just in these areas, but uh, you know uh, across uh, not just the economic and uh, commercial side, but also on the political and security side as well. Um, uh, it goes back to the point that I made earlier. Uh, our reputation in the region is diminished. Uh, and in order for us to make these arguments in a strong and uh, credible and forceful way, uh, we need to get back in the game in a, um, uh, you know, uh, a, 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 I know that this is the term that uh, um, uh, is uh, that the president doesn't like, but in a in a global way, in a globalist way, um, we need to show that we are a global player and that uh, we're we are engaged and that uh, you know the. The principles that we are advancing are principles that all countries uh, should embrace. Um, again, that doesn't necessarily mean that um, you know that's going to realize a specific deal, at this, you know, a specific identified deal. But it does create the conditions, I think, for potential uh, uh, positive commercial outcomes f for U.S. interests and, and, and for for other uh, Japanese interests as well. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you. Um, I agree with uh, you know many of the points which has been raised by previous mm. speakers, and then uh, concerning China, uh, I, I agree with uh, Mr. Yu. Uh, you know we do not necessarily need to how can I say uh, contain or something uh, China or something. We uh, should uh, make an effort to engage in China, and to do so, uh, we need to how can I say show good examples. Um, you know, I have talked a lot about climate change, but uh, for example, you know, uh, the in the uh, COP24 negotiation, uh, China strongly resisted uh, the equal transparency framework between developed and developing countries. So that is very much telling a story. Uh, but uh, you know, the uh, on the other hand, uh, China is perceived as a climate leader because of its massive investment for uh, photovoltaics or electric vehicles or something. So they are selling very much good image. But in uh, reality, reality uh, there is still a lot of you know, the intransparency. So I think uh, US and Japanese companies should take a lead in disclosing a lot of information about uh, carbon performance so that uh, Chinese SOEs can also follow suit. Yeah, and uh, also in terms of the investment, uh, you know, again, uh, APEC has agreed on quality investment, uh, not just you know, cheap investment, but a high quality investment. There, also Japan and the U.S. can take uh, show some examples, and uh, perhaps uh, in the case of Japan, uh, which we what we could differentiate ourselves from Chinese investment is uh, very much how can I say tailor-made investment at uh, the together with capacity building and also very much you know the uh, the uh, high quality service uh, after services uh, for operation maintenance or something. Uh, it is not just constructing plant and go away. No, it is not our approach. So that kind of added value uh, should be emphasized, and also with uh, some sort of environmental performance. So uh, by doing so, uh, if China does not go uh, follow uh, that examples, then uh, China could be re regarded as not responsible partner uh, in that endeavor. So uh, in order to persuade China, in order to engage China, uh, US and Japan have to show good examples. <laughs> so that is very much important point, I think. Excellent, thank you very much. I'd like to take questions from the floor, gentlemen in the back. Thank you, uh, Robert Schreiter with International Investor. I, I came in a little late, but I, I haven't heard much about uh, this in relationship to the trade negotiations going on. I, I wonder if anyone could speculate on, A, what is the potential for a trade agreement um, in volume or any other way that we could measure it? 
Uh, clearly, it's going to be high on the U.S. agenda to be pushing LNG and uh, other energy sales to Japan. Japan's one of our best partners. It seems to be in the interest of both nations to do so. So regardless of how you feel on green energy, it seems like right now for the immediate future, this is a very practical, pragmatic approach for the trade negotiations. Could you, anyone speculate on where that stands? Yeah. Uh, I, I'm not sure I, I can you know, make a straightforward answer or not. But I'd like to underline that the energy trade has further potentials. And up until today, actually, the, the bilateral agreement to develop new markets to absorb U.S. energy uh, has been over-focused on Asia, actually. Because, as everyone knows, it's the Pacific is the region that you know, triggers the future gas demand growth. But uh, I'm happy to mention this as this attention currency because uh, as today, the global gas market is getting more and more integrated internationally. Formerly compartmentalized, a regional gas market are uh, getting into one actually. In, in, a, in other words, uh, gas is becoming more and more commoditized against the backdrop of uh, drastic increases of uh, LNG export for the United States. And, and we also need to pay more attention to what is happening in Europe, European gas markets, the politics. Uh, I, you know, uh, the European nations are trying to relax the dependence upon gas pipe from Russia, and actually they are expanding a lot of LNG receiving terminals, despite the fact that the existing um, LNG terminals in Europe have been underutilized less than 50%, but still, as a political decision, the uh, uh, drastically changing gas market, and what is happening uh, in Europe has you no know, direct and indirect impact upon the global gas market in which Asia Pacific market is also you know, changing. So what I'm going to say is that US Japan LNG partnership should be extended in global scale. This is such a big missing point in today's bilateral talks. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I would like to take two questions first here and then Yes. Two gentlemen, please identify yourself. Hi, my name. Hello, my name is Arya Asad Sangabi, here with uh, NATO, New Energy and Industrial Technology Development Organization. My question is on the uh, Japan SISTI, the Council on Science, Technology, and Innovation, in particular in the uh, fifth basic plan for science technology. They want to improve the Society 5.0, which is a concept of the fusion between cyber and the physical spaces. So my question is, um, where does Society 5.0 sit between the Japan-U.S. Uh, energy partnership? And in particular, um, Arima-san, if you could touch on the role of research and development and demonstration uh, in the future partnership. Thank, thank you. you. Uh, Bob Eichord from the Atlantic Council. Uh, thank you all for your remarks. Uh, Mr. Ito, um, I mean, clearly as, as Fukushima had a major impact on Japan's energy position, mm -hmm. as you mentioned, the restart is going to have a big impact to and progress mm -hmm. in the restart, um, which I guess there's nine reactors now have been yeah, reactors. reactors. Yeah. Um, I, I haven't looked at your new, the Institute's new outlook, but I was quoted as saying that you're projecting uh, maybe 13 percent energy mix from nuclear by 2030, which is lower than some of the other estimates. Uh, is that correct? And what, and what do you see as then the way that Japan will have to move to compensate if that projection is, is, is right. Um, and, and quickly, Alan, Asia Reassurance Act, any, any comments about that? What, what does it mean? Mm -hmm. yes. 
Okay, so then, uh, mm -hmm. can I can sure. I comment on uh, sure. uh, the uh, uh, society of 5.0? Mm -hmm. And uh, the uh, city, I, as you rightly pointed out, uh, you know, the very much important uh, the building block is society 5.0. And Society 5.0 uh, needs to uh, in entail many, many innovation. <laughs> and uh, innovation, of course, Japan can do a lot uh, alone uh, using government R&D budget or you know, engaging the you know, private sectors. But uh, there are uh, ample pot possibilities uh, for international collaboration. And as I emphasized, uh, the US and Japan are two uh, technology giant countries. So then uh, we can exchange our information and we can do some uh, technology collaboration. Uh, to make uh, that technology, uh, the Society 5.0, happen. And uh, I think uh, Society 5.0, uh, we have tremendous implication also for climate change mitigation because uh, that will digitalize energy systems and also that will, say, optimize energy use and supply. So uh, without hurting uh, people's utility, uh, that has a, poten uh, a vast potential uh, for, uh, say, reducing greenhouse gas emission without any pain and without any cost. So uh, there, I think US and Japan can collaborate a lot. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you Ed, for leading this question. It's such a very uh, answer sensitive, it's just super difficult question. Uh, first of all, I'm not involved in the econometrics now research team, so I don't know the details. But I might take it that even to boost the share of nuclear up to 13% is not so easy. I personally support that the idea that Japan needs to restart as many reactors as possible as a responsible civilian nuclear stakeholder on the global market. But nuclear question has been so much politicized. Soon after the Fukushima disaster, the government could say that without you know, restarting nuclear reactors, Japan's economy would be damaged so seriously. Very few people believe it today. Although, as a matter of fact, without restarting nuclear reactors, it would gradually trigger hollowing out of the Japanese economy. No doubt about it. But only professionals know it. And the, the government is you know, getting uh, more and more serious headache. How to justify the reason to restart nuclear reactors? And what I want to say today is that Japan needs to approach this nuclear question uh, not only from domestic perspectives, more importantly from international perspectives. Without rehabilitation of Japanese nuclear sector, it is demanded to U.S. Uh, nuclear vendors as well, because U.S. and Japan are nuclear twins. We need to keep hold, hold on the you know, transparent, sustainable maintenance of global non proliferation regime. Can I, can sure, I? sure. Yeah, I, I with respect to uh, nuclear in Japan, uh, as Mr. Ito said, it is a very challenging question. And uh, people who argue that we don't need a restart of nuclear, uh, they quite often argue that we have not experienced any blackout. So they do not recognize that uh, the bulk of the power uh, compensating nuclear loss is coming from fossil fuels emitting uh, CO2 and also increasing uh, our fossil fuel import. So people do not care uh, or which source is uh, producing power. So that means uh, people are not caring so much about climate change. So in the United States, for example, Union of Concerned, concerned uh, Scientists quite recently published a report that in order to reduce CO2 emissions, uh, you need to not only promoting renewables, but also you need to maintain nuclear capacity in the US. So I very much envy uh, such a sensible argument is going on in the US. In Japan, uh, you know, very much you know, uh, the dichotomous discussion such as nuclear versus renewable is going on. And that is not productive at all. So, ironically, uh, you know, in order to convince people about the necessity of nuclear, yes, uh, global issues such as nuclear non-proliferation is important, but they not, that may not be the interest of the people on the street. Mm -hmm. So, for the people on the street, uh, they need to realize that climate change is daunting, and uh, in order to address climate change, uh, renewable may not be sufficient at this point in time. So, therefore, uh, the vast amount of non-fossil fuel 
is important. That kind of you know the narrative is important, I think. <laughs> Bob, very, really quickly on the Re Asia Reassurance Act, um, uh, I, I think it's a terrific signal from the Congress, but uh, you know <laughs> that's the Congress, and uh, you know we need we need the reassurance uh, and stability uh, from from the administration, which I think is still lacking. So. Is there a, yeah, okay. One final question. Lady in the back. Hey, thank you. My name is Courtney Weatherby, and I'm from the Stimson Center's Southeast Asia program. I'm curious, all of you have laid out the emerging initiatives under the Indo-Pacific for U.S.-Japan collaboration on the government side. But as we know, the needs for energy infrastructure in developing Asia are significant enough that no individual country can meet them, not even China's trillion dollar invested BRI. So I'm curious if you can talk about the readiness of the private sector here and in Japan for collaboration and the extent to which mm -hmm. the government initiatives, for instance, MOUs between OPEC and JBEC and GSEP and the, the other initiatives are ready to sort of support the private sector mm -hmm. in bringing that needed infrastructure investment in. Thank you. Uh, what I would say is uh, this: uh, the uh, you know all of those mechanisms that uh, I mentioned uh, are trying to create a platform for uh, you know for these uh, companies to to get together. Um, I'll uh, defer to uh, my colleagues from Japan to speak to you know the resources and the kind of the accelerating opportunities that um, you know the official finance uh, can offer from. Uh, uh, JPEC and, and others. Um, from the U.S. side, uh, you know, we've looked at, uh, well, uh, when I used to be in the government, we looked at this uh, as a partnership in which, uh, you know, Japan obviously has, you know, these long-standing um, relationships and, uh, and programs and projects in the, in the region. Um, where the, the the hope was that you know we could bring U.S. companies in uh, and uh, as partners, simply because uh, you know w w our companies haven't had as lo um, a long of a track record track record in uh, in doing these big infrastructure projects. Um, I think the jury's still out on how uh, how well that's going to play out. Um, the, the Japanese side, obviously, many companies that have been, you know, operating for decades in these uh, in these areas with, uh, um, you know, with big projects. Um, th th I think that they're in a uh, um, um, they're in a better position to to address uh, address your question. Thank you. Oh uh, well, uh, okay. Uh, first, uh, let me uh, lay out a further picture. Okay. Washington, Tokyo, I read to, to find new business projects in the in the side countries of the Indo-Pacific area. And at the same time, actually Japan and China have agreed to, to work on finding po prospective collaborative projects in the side countries. And Washington has been nervous about it. And in terms of Japan's would be cooperation with the China, actually, uh, my take is that the government is waiting for proposals coming out from the bottom, from the private sector. Meanwhile, Beijing is you know, developing BRI as a state initiative. So I don't know where they go. And uh, as well, I talked to many policy makers, they don't know the answer. Uh, both towards Washington and Beijing. And uh, I'd like to say that actually this is such a missing point. Uh, Washington and Tokyo need to seriously think about how we could possibly engage China in the side countries. And I don't see any sense to see such clear cut dichotomy between you know, the, some activities or along with BRI and on the one hand and you know some activities on the in the Pacific dimension. You know, it's easy to, to say that just as a political game. But when we it comes to the question of business, mm -hmm. it's more complicated. And of course, uh, China question is becoming more and more sensitive in many ways. That's why Washington and Tokyo need to sit together more closely to think about 
how we could effectively engage China for everyone's you know, benefit. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, everyone. I'd like to um, thank again for the panelists for your um, excellent remarks and discussion, and also thank you for all for coming today. And we'll be having um, the second event on the similar um, topic, so please stay tuned, and we would like to um, see you the next time soon. Thank you.